Hi, everyone. As Dan said, my name is Lori Peake, and I'm a professor of sociology and director of the Natural Hazard Center, and also the leader of the Neary Converge facility. And I am so honored to be in front of you today. I know a predominantly engineering audience, so thank you for allowing a sociologist to be in the room with you. I am so excited to be here, not just because of who I am or what I do, but because of what I represent in the Neary facility and the Neary Shared Use Infrastructure. And so we've already heard today so much about the investment that the National Science Foundation has made in the physical infrastructure and also in the cyber infrastructure. But as we also heard alluded to this morning, the National Science Foundation has made an incredible investment in what I refer to as the social infrastructure the organizations, the networks, the invisible ties that bind us together. And ultimately, that means it's an investment in people. And that is what I am so excited to talk to you about today. And so the argument that I want to make today is that engineers and social scientists are going to need to work even more closely together if we are going to address and maybe even have a chance at solving the biggest challenges that are facing humanity today. And so I'd like to know by a show of hands for all of you in the room, whether you're social scientist, engineer, or other, how many of you have had what you would consider a deep, a deep partnership or collaboration across disciplines and in particular across engineering and social science. How many of you really like deep collaboration? Okay, I hope for the many, many hands that aren't up that we're gonna do a little conversion activity in the next 20 minutes. And so um, for over 20 years, I have had the gift and honor, and I mean it when I say those words, gift and honor of working with engineers in a lot of different capacities. And here I am still standing and smiling, and I love it. And I think we need to do even way, way more than what we're already doing, and we need to be doing it better and in deeper collaboration. And here are four reasons why I have come to believe that and to know that with my whole being. Number one, why I think engineers and social scientists need to work so much more closely together is because there is no such thing as a natural disaster. There are natural hazards, of course there are, they abound, and natural hazards are unfolding every single day around the world. But there is no such thing as a natural disaster because disasters occur when a natural hazard collides with a vulnerable people and vulnerable infrastructure and technical systems that are not prepared for that natural hazard. We need to work together. Number two, we need to work together as engineers and social scientists because when it comes to addressing natural hazards losses and the escalating harm and suffering we're seeing across our society and around the world, we need to recognize that the challenges we face are not simply technical. They are moral, they are ethical, they are political, and they are profoundly social. And we need to name that, and that means we need to address it. And so one model that I like to use when trying to sort of talk about this is that the kind of environmental challenges or disasters that many of us in this room have dedicated our <clears throat> lives to trying to address, they are indeed problems for society. They cause deaths and injury, damages, dollars lost, and displacement. And in response to those problems for society, many of you in this room, and with the deepest bow of gratitude to all of you, you have tried to develop technical fixes for these problems for society that are only growing worse. But here's what I'd like to bring into the room, is that these are not just problems for society, they're problems of society. They're social problems that are causing natural hazards to turn into disasters. It's about poverty, it's about racism, it's about colonialism and conquest. It's about population growth in hazardous areas and unsustainable development, and it's about profit over people and short-sighted thinking. It's about unadopted building codes and standards and unenforced building codes and standards. Those are the problems of society that turn natural hazards into disasters. And so what that means is there is, of course, no easy 
quick technical fix for what are really at the root profoundly social, moral, ethical, and political problems. And what that means is that we need to work together for a social fix. Number three, and I'm gonna take a deep breath here because I know I'm talking to a room of very, very precise people who like to get things right. But here's what I need to say. When engineers and social scientists do not work together in true partnership and to, true collaboration, we're at a real risk of getting things wrong. I give all recognition to the growing number of engineers, physical scientists, and others who recognize that social problems are at the root of the challenges we're facing, and they're trying to integrate human factors or social concerns into their models and scenarios. But the issue is, when we don't work in deep collaboration, the assumptions that are built into those models, they may be wrong. They may be flat out wrong, and that may have deadly consequences for the people that we're trying to serve and protect. As we may be getting it wrong if we're building in incomplete or inaccurate assumptions into our model, or we may just get it less right than we could otherwise. And here's where I want to uplift again, we've heard her name already today, Elena Sutley, in her groundbreaking dissertation work. What she did was she integrated sociological and socioeconomic considerations into her understanding of how mitigation, earthquake mitigation, with wood story construction, how when we think about socioeconomic considerations, how might that change what we know about mitigation? And what she learned is, we're right, mitigation saves. But when we bring in the social considerations, she found that mitigation saves even more. And it saves even more, especially for the most vulnerable among us. And so we may be getting it less right at the cost of thinking about justice and equity and reducing hazards losses for the most vulnerable among us. So let's work together. Fourth reason, when we do work together, because by definition, all of our lenses, what we see of the world is incomplete. But when we work together, we have a chance to see more of the world and to gain a clearer understanding of problems while developing more just and equitable solutions. In 2011, I had the um, great opportunity to travel to New Zealand after the Christchurch earthquakes with a large team of engineers, and I was one of a handful of social and behavioral scientists who were on that team. And one of the things that I was studying when I was there was trying to understand how the earthquake and the incredible destruction to the built environment, what it did to women and children who were in battered women's and battered uh, women's shelters in New Zealand. And I was focused on the people, their stories, their experiences. And one of the things that my engineering colleagues helped me to see was the role the built environment and the destruction of the built environment, how that was shaping the women and children's stories. Because when women's homes were destroyed, sometimes they were forced back into the homes of the abusers who they had tried to flee. Two of the three available battered women shelters in Christchurch were shut down, were red tagged. And so what I helped my engineering colleagues to see, I hope, was that the choices they were making about what buildings they did and did not assess, that has a ramification because it's about who we see and who we don't see. Because when we don't go to assess or do reconnaissance for the structures that house our most vulnerable citizens, we're, our knowledge is incomplete. And so that's where, again, the fourth and maybe the most pressing reason why I think we have to work together is that we can see the world better, we can characterize the problems more clearly, but then we can work together to develop solutions. So Jennifer Bridge said to me when I practiced this talk with her and Dan, she and Dan, she said, okay, Lori, I'm in. <laughs> I want to collaborate with social scientists, how? Okay, by a show of hands, how many of you want to collaborate with social scientists? Even if you haven't, okay, thank you. 
Okay. Walt Peacock is here. Nicole Errett, Lauren Clay, we're here. We're here. We want to collaborate. We want to lead, too. We want to co-lead with you. And so what NERI Converge as one of the facilities in the shared use network, what we are really dedicated to is to working in partnership with the engineering facilities, with reconnaissance net networks to try to establish this social infrastructure for doing convergent disaster research that involves networks of engineers and social scientists working to together in that deep collaboration. And so what is the roadmap? Four big steps that we're working together on is to identify, train, connect, and support. That's the mission. I want to say something to you, though, about the motivation. And so we know that reducing the suffering caused by disasters, it requires connection, connection to one another, but it also is going to require systemic change in terms of how we do disaster research. And that's what NERI has been all about, about transforming not just what we study, but how we do the studies and who's involved in the studies. And a personal note on the, the motivation for Converge. Converge was established in 2018 following the, the deadly and catastrophic 2017 hurricane season. And I, like many of you, I had been for a decade prior studying the long-term effects of Hurricane Katrina, still unfolding, still unfolding today. And then in 2017, as Harvey, Irma, Maria tore through different communities and affected different people, but the sociological patterns were the same. They were absolutely the same. It was the poor, the vulnerable, people of color, people with chronic medical conditions, children, the elderly, people living in substandard housing who were the most impacted in 2017, just like in 2005, just like 100 years prior. And it's heartbreaking for those of us in this room to watch that unfold time and time again. It's also maddening to know that the answers are in this room. So many of the answers are in this room, but what can we do to get the answers into the hands of those who need it most? That is what NERI is also about, and we need to name it and never lose sight of it. For the, so the four steps. Identify is step one. We already saw this once today. I've never gone to a disaster meeting where the disaster loss you know, graphic doesn't show up somewhere. It was right in the keynote this morning. I was excited. I was hoping it was going to show up somewhere. There it was. But here's, I mean, I'm not happy about what's happening. I'm happy the graphic <laughs> showed up, just to be clear. I'm on camera, just to be clear. Um, but when I see that graphic, again, your resident sociologist right up here, I don't just see the statistical patterns. What I see is that every time there is a new disaster, there are new disaster studies that are being launched, and there are new disaster researchers that are being drawn into this field. And this field has grown rapidly in a relatively short period of time because the disasters are coming hard and fast. And what that means is some of us in this room were trained to be disaster researchers. We had all the support and mentoring in the world. Others, the disaster came to us, like Walt Peacock. When Miami, when his home was struck by Hurricane Andrew in 1992, the disaster came to him. And then he became one of our leaders in this field, but the disaster came to him. He didn't choose this necessarily. And that's what's happening more and more and more frequently. So a question we ask at Converge is, how can we catalyze the power of the people who are coming into our field, who may or may not have access to the knowledge and information and the training that others have had access to? So the first step in Converge is, literally, we got to identify the researchers. And so one of the things that we started working on in 2017, 2018, is that we launched the Social Science Extreme Events Research Network. And there are 1,400 plus social and behavioral scientists around the world who have joined that network. And not only are they located on the SCIR map, you can also find the researchers by their talent and their expertise, because not all social scientists are the same. 
depending on the question, oh boy, are we different. And so there are over 20 disciplines in the social and behavioral sciences alone, and that's like a conservative count. And so depending on the question you're asking, as Greg was talking, I was thinking, oh, he needs an economist, but he also needs an urban planner, and he definitely needs a sociologist. He maybe needs an anthropologist to get a little culture in there, and so forth. And so identify the researchers, but also know the researchers by their expertise and their talent so that, again, we can collaborate more carefully. Second step in the process, train. So once we've identified the researchers, a big question that I've long asked, really, for over 20 years, is how can we democratize access to this incredible store of knowledge, decades and decades and decades worth of knowledge in an event-driven field like ours? Because what happens in the disaster field, every disaster is different, every disaster is unique. But one of the things that we know is repeating the same disaster lesson over and over and over again without all the context for all that has come before, as we heard from Tracy this morning, it's done little to move the policy needle. It takes something different to move that policy needle. And so how can we train researchers to make sure that they have access to that fundamental store of knowledge? So it's about the what do researchers know, and that's something big we're working on at Converge. We have 10 training modules already available on everything from how do you collect and share perishable data to how do you work with vulnerable populations to how do you do ethically informed hazards and disaster research. And so how, it's the what, but it's also about the how. Because if we are ever gonna change the face of this field to make sure that our field is reflective of the people who we study and serve, we're also gonna to have to train differently and educate differently. And we're gonna to have to train and educate with a diversity, equity, and inclusion lens in mind where we're thinking carefully about that. So we're committed to that too, how we train, not just what we train on. Third, connect. So once we've identified researchers, and thanks to the National Science Foundation and the support of the Extreme Events Research and Reconnaissance Networks, we now have eight networks that are bringing researchers together within disciplines, but also thanks to the NERI shared use facilities, we're helping to bring researchers together across disciplines. And so not only to help identify within the social sciences and geotech and structural, but also to figure out how can we work together across disciplines, but also across hazard types, across time scales, and ultimately merging us together across the data types that we collect. And so one of our mantras at Converge, why connecting matters, is because that's how we communicate, coordinate, and ultimately can collaborate how engineers and social scientists can work together. And why does this matter? There's an ethical imperative that we do this, especially in the context of field reconnaissance. That the ethical imperative is when we do communicate, coordinate and collaborate, we can actually lessen the burden, not just on affected communities and affected people who may not wanna fill out 40 of our sur surveys. We can lessen the burden on affected people, but also on emergency management, on locally affected researchers who are also dealing with so much. So we can, there's an ethical imperative to do this, but also we can improve the science. Because when we do communicate, coordinate, and collaborate, we can set a shared scientific vision. We can ask interdisciplinary and even transdisciplinary questions. We can hone and refine our data collection skills, and we can also share the data rapidly in new and different ways. Fourth step, support. How do we offer support in a context where the risk is literally outrunning us? This is something that every single day we ask this question every day at the Natural Hazard Center and at Converge. How do we offer support in a context where the risk is outrunning us and is outrunning our community? And so three things we're committed to is about prioritizing disaster-affected researchers. And this is something that GEAR and STEER with their reconnaissance missions have done an extraordinary job of ensuring that locally affected researchers help to lead the way to set the agenda, to say what are the big questions that we're already seeing on the ground. 
And so prioritizing disaster-affected researchers, promoting equitable partnerships. And so doing convergent research isn't about top-down that we as experts, social scientists, and engineers know what the answer is. It's about bottom-up, local participatory convergent research. And finally, we're about funding research that is convergent in nature, that is problem-focused, but is also solution-based. The word converge at its root, it means to incline together. To incline together. What a beautiful root definition. And so when we incline together, to me it means we're coming together in new and different ways, but also to move forward in new and different ways with that problem focus, but also with that solution base. And with that, I end with what I think are two of the most powerful words in the English language. Thank you to all of you, all of you for the work that you do every single day. Thank you for the time, effort, care, and thought that you put into it. And as we move forward, may we ensure that every technical fix that we create also is a social fix, because that is the only way that we are going to outrun the risk. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.